The presentation you are logged in for is Outreach and Virtual Resources from the Royal BC Museum. And I'm coming to you today from the traditional territories of the Lekwungen people. My name is Kim Goff and I'm a learning program developer here at the Royal BC Museum. I was born on Treaty 8 land and grew up on Treaty 6 land in Alberta. My parents were settlers there, my father from England and my mom from Saskatchewan. And since 2007, I've lived on the traditional speaking territories of the, Lekwung, of the Lekwungen speaking people known as the Songhees and Esquimalt First Nations in what is now known as Victoria, British Columbia. So I have a question up here for you to please use the chat uh, and let me know if you have used a virtual or online resource from the Royal BC Museum. You can say yes or no. Uh, if you say yes, let me know what you used. Uh, or even, you know what, you can turn on your microphone. There's not that many of us. I'm comfortable with either option. Uh, so again, throughout the presentation today, I'll invite you to use the chat to ask any questions as we go through. Gurjinder, no, you haven't used anything from us yet, thanks. Hopefully we'll uh, excite you with some of the options that we have here. Excellent. So if you haven't, uh, maybe you've been here before. Uh, well, here we are, here's our big beautiful province and the Royal BC Museum is located in Victoria, British Columbia and is the provincial museum of British Columbia. The museum was founded in 1886 and the archives in 1894. And the building that you see here is our current home, which was built in 1967. We collect archives, documents, and specimens of British Columbia from both the natural world and representing human history human and natural history. <laughs> Most people are familiar with our exhibits, which are housed in that building you see on the left side of your screen. And we're going to take a closer look at some of those exhibits in just a moment. But many people are not aware of our large collection, some of which is housed in that tower that you see on the right side of the screen. We have long since outgrown our space for the collection, and we are undertaking and developing a new collections and research building, which is going to be built in the nearby community of Colwood and an anticipated opening of 2025. That building won't have exhibits, but there, it will be a hub for school visits, both in person and virtually. As the Provincial Museum, we take our commitment and responsibility to connect with learners across the province very seriously. And there are lots of ways you can connect to us from wherever you are. This map shows some of the reach of our online and outreach programs, not just here in BC, but around the world. Those blue dots you see are point-to-point -point interactions, so things like this, one-to-one uh, -one connections with classrooms using Zoom. The green dots are webinars. Um, a lot of those green dots you see in the United States are because of our partners with the CILC, the Center for Interactive Learning and Collaboration. They are like, they are a hub for many, many different um, presentations for schools to join in. If you haven't heard of them, check them out. I highly recommend them. Yellow, uh, the yellow dots are showing where people have signed in and taken part in our at home programs. These are programs that we do live monthly uh, at noon or 11 o'clock. We have one for adults, one for kids, one where we go outside. All of that is on our website. But even better, all of them have been recorded and are on the Royal BC Museum's YouTube channel. Today, though, we're going to take a mini digital field trip. And we are going to go into the galleries with that. And I'll be reviewing our outreach kits, our handling collection, and how to access the learning portal. So digital field trips are up first. And they are live two-way interactive virtual learning experiences where we can see and hear you and you can see and hear us. They are inquiry-based and staff-led, and we can adapt a digital field trip for different grade ranges, and we offer a big variety of programs. But why talk about them when we can go see one for ourselves? So we're going to join my colleague, Jenny, who's upstairs and, oh, sorry, she's upstairs on the second floor. So let me stop my sharing. There you are, Jenny. I'm going to try to highlight you and get you to unmute, and I'm going to spotlight you. Hello, everybody, and welcome to the second floor of the Royal BC Museum. I'm currently showing you the view from the second floor of the exhibits building. 
um, downtown Victoria. It's a little bit rainy today. So while I explain some of our digital programs to you, you may see quite a few guests in the galleries because rainy days usually mean that we have a lot more guests inside. Yes. Um, so all of our programs usually start with um, either showing the location of British Columbia or making sure that the guests know exactly where we are joining them from. I'll flip the camera around so you can see who has been talking to you. Hello, everyone. My name is Jenny Arnold, and I am a digital educator here at the Royal BC Museum. Before we do a little mini tour, I'm going to explain a little bit more about the digital field trip programs that we offer. The first one I'm going to talk about is our newest type of program, and they're museum snapshot tours. These tours are 20 minutes long, and they are $50, and these programs are very short and sweet and are very focused on one specific topic. For example, we provide a Meet the Mammoth program when we join Kim, who you just met, um, in the distance learning room, and we learn a little bit more about mammoths and look under the document camera at maybe some um, objects around mammoths. We also have a program called Home and Community, where we go up and we walk through the Becoming BC Gallery and we speak with students about what is a home? What is a community? What is the diversity of British Columbia? What are some risks when people were settling over here in British Columbia? And that age is for younger students. So that's around K to three. And all of our programs, we try to adapt it for exact age group it is. So home community, a little bit younger. Um, for maybe an older audience. We also have Simple Machines, where we look at the tools that developed British Columbia from the wheel and axle to the, um, the oh, I almost forgot all of them. That's the one that I do. Um, the pulley, there's a lot of other really cool um, programs up in the Becoming BC Gallery. We also have natural history ones called Amazing Adaptations where we discuss with the students the different types of adaptations animals have that help them survive. Like an owl, we show an owl's wing and how it's pretty silent. I wonder why that adaptation really helps them out in the wild. So those are our 20 minute programs. The next type of programs we have are our gallery tours, what are 30 minutes long. Those programs are $75 and um, they are, more about the type of exhibits that we have here at the museum. Currently, we have the Becoming BC Gallery or BC History. We have the Natural History. We have the Orcas exhibit, um, which we'll be walking through shortly. And we also have the First People's Gallery. An important thing to know about all of our Indigenous programs is that they are led by Leslie McGarry, who is contracted to do all of our Indigenous programs here. And her knowledge and expertise of these exhibits and all of the belongings in here is astronomical. It is so important that she's the one who is leading these programs. And they are definitely our most popular programs, which leads me to our 45 minute programs, which are $120. And those programs, um, three of them are led by Leslie McGarry. The first one is for younger students, which is Animals in the Seasons, where we walk through the galleries, we talk about um, the connection with Indigenous people and animals and the seasons. There's usually a little um, activity we do. There's some storytelling involved. Um, for an older audience, there's also BC his Indigenous history, which talks about pre-contact and post-contact history. And the final one is about governance. And um, that one is for older audiences, but can be adapted for younger ones. As we do know that Indigenous governments is in the curriculum for around grade fives as well. So we're really good at adapting what types of programs those are. We also have some different ones like museum career exploration. Have you or your students ever wondered who works at a museum? What different types of departments? What do you have to be to work at a museum? We have um, people who do construction. We have people in marketing. We have people in the collection. We have scientists. We have conservationists. We have so many different people. Wouldn't it be really cool to ask them as many questions as we can? That is another program that we do offer here for 45 minutes, which is museum career exploration. Um, we also can adapt programs to make sure that fits your, your group. For example, if you have a group that's larger than 50, we have a webinar add-on so you can have more students join in and enjoy the program. As Kim was mentioning, we try to make it as interactive as possible. So we usually 
provide as much pre-programming and post-programming materials for you. We usually link to our learning portal that has a lot of really interesting um, lesson plans and um, multimedia resources such as listening or videos um, that you can watch to really enhance your visit. So that's a little bit more about the types of programs that we have. But instead of talking about all of them that we have, why don't I show you a little bit of an example of what a digital program is? I'm currently up, as I said, on the second floor, and I am holding a gimbal to help stabilize this phone I'm using. And this is how we would reach other um, groups. And I'll, what I'll do is I'll flip the camera around. And I'll show you where we are. We are in the very entrance of the Orcas Our Shared Future, which is our featured exhibit on right now until March 31st. And this program is usually led by Mark Learn Young, who was one of the authors for this specific exhibit. He would join in distantly and we would go back and forth between highlighting his video and highlighting the, this camera showing the exhibit. Some of our programs have a specific educator right in front of the camera the entire time. Some of them are like this, where we're showing you the gallery. And some of them, like I said, is Mark joining distantly. So for example, what we would show is some of the stars of the exhibit. So right in front of me, we see Ruffles or J1. Something really interesting about Ruffles is that you can see his very, very large fin, dorsal fin up there. One of the reasons why he's called Ruffles, well, the main reason he's called Ruffles is because he has Ruffles in that dorsal fin, which made it really easy for scientists to identify him and why he is J1. He was one of the first workers ever identified. Jenny, so here. Oh, oh sorry, Jenny. Yeah. I have to say something I love about um, doing the field trips, but I is, you know, of course, when I'm in the gallery, but even here watching them on the screen, I it's just you do feel that excitement that you get when you're here in the exhibits. Often we'll hear kids yeah. ooing and awing and uh, getting really excited about what they see. Definitely. It's a great way to become more accessible, as we saw on that map. We're located at the very bottom of Vancouver Island and it can be very difficult for people to be able to join us. So this is a way to make the galleries more accessible and um, the museum more accessible, but also sometimes even more informative than being here on site. For example, for this program, you usually be able to talk with Mark who has a wealth of knowledge about orcas. For example, he will talk about how, if you look at this fin, those sure look like fingers, which really helps students understand, hey, these are mammals. This is Rhapsody, which is a complete skeleton of an orca who is chasing a salmon. And the reason why she's chasing salmon is, one of the reasons why she passed away is because of the lack of food in the Salish Sea. And she was also pregnant at the time. And it was a very, very difficult pregnancy. And she actually, the, the fetus actually died within her and actually created a lot of toxins within her body. And one of the other reasons why she did pass away. So I wonder if I show you this, put in the chat, what one do you think is the human brain? And what one do you think is the orca brain? The one on the left or the right is the human brain. What do you think? Are they actual size, the Jenny? Yes. Actual size. Can you put your hand by one so we get a sense of how oh, big yeah. they are? Okay. Mm. Go ahead, folks. Try it in your, your type in the chat, right or left, right or left. Human brain on the right, human brain on the left. They're both very knobbly and nudgely. We're getting, <laughs> we're getting vote. We're going with right, right. Right, correct. Right. Yes. This one is the human brain. Humans used to think we were the most complex being because we had the biggest brain. Well, this clearly shows that it's not true. Then we thought we were the most complex because we have the most cortical folds. Well, orcas actually have a whole other lobe for echolocation. 
Yeah. So echolocation. So awesome. Jenny, can you say briefly what you mean by that? Yeah. So there's a little bit of a diorama right here about echolocation. So orcas are able to send out pings into the um into the water and they can actually kind of see what is in front of them. So if there is a salmon swimming, they can send out a ping and they're pinging actually the salmon's swim bladder, which helps them move. And they will know which direction that swim bladder is trying to get the orca to move. And the pin will come back to them and they'll be like, oh, they're going that way. And they will follow you. These orcas are so fascinating that even um, orcas in captivity were known to know if one of the female trainers were pregnant before the female trainer was, because they could see inside of us. And a lot of people were like, well, aren't orcas scary? They're called sometimes killer whales. Well, that's because whale, they kill other whales. Some of them, not all of them, but some of them do kill other whales. There is no evidence of any orca harming a human in the wild. Even if you had the best pretend seal suit ever, <laughs> they can use that echolocation and be like, hey, they're so pretty you, bony. So you're saying I could go swimming in a seal suit and make seal sounds, but an orca would look at take one look at me with echolocation and go, that's not a seal. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> I, I I have my timer on. I have run out of time to talk about more things. So I'm quickly yeah, trying to walk through. It's so nice yeah. to see this space. This is great. It talks about captivity and about the first orcas, about um, SeaWorld, where they created Shamu, which was, they wanted Namu, but which was the first whale in captivity, but they didn't get the right, so they named it She-Namu, or Namu. So uh, for folks, Namu, who was the first orca whale in captivity, was uh, a J-Pod resident, so a local um, killer whale from Pacific here, the Pacific Northwest. So they're they're kind of like the stars of the world, the, all those famous orcas we know. There is a question here, Jenny, and perhaps you can explain it a little bit. Uh, you were saying yeah. that the orca knew the trainer was pregnant. How did the trainer yeah. know the orca knew that? What they noticed is that the orca started acting a little bit different around that specific trainer, was being a little bit more gentle with it. And also, um, I, if I'm remembering correctly, I believe Mark was saying that it was um, pu- like putting it mouth or like being more gentle around it, the trainer's stomach than usually. So behaving is, it was behaving differently. Yes. So this is then, our shared future, right? Yes. This is some of the pollution yes. that was found, garbage that was picked up from local beaches. And, and this, this part of the gallery is more about our shared future, about exactly what Kim was saying about some of the risks that orcas face that are also our risks. And we talk about during the program is what is the difference? Why, why do people care about orcas? Here on the coast, we, we know pretty well why orcas matter. But when you try to say pitch a movie or let people know why orcas are, are very popular or need to be protected, it's important to also say why, because these are the apex predators. If they're at risk, that is like the canary in the coal mine. We know something is up and something is wrong. One of the final pieces here is a Haida screen from Bill Reed, which is just gorgeous. Yeah, that's a huge 3D carving. So on both all, all sides of it, you can see amazing shapes and stories. And it's really talking about that interconnectedness between people, nature, and animals. And then we have some orchestra saying goodbye at the end. And usually for all of our programs, we leave time at the end for more questions that people have about um, what they've seen in the orcas, if they have any follow-up questions. And then we end with a little bit of an exciting orca, a new hope. We show all of the new orcas that have been born while this exhibit was being created. And one of the newest ones is Element at the very end, who was just named And um, when we were doing these programs before, it wasn't named yet. And we would send the students to the website where they could vote on what to name this orca. And it ended up being named Element. Its mother was named Surprise. So this was kind of like an element of surprise. (laughs) And we were very excited that it's a female because we do need more female orcas um, in the Salish Sea. So that is a quick 
little tour. So hopefully you learned a little bit about the digital programs. If there's any questions, please let me know before I go. But thank you for joining me up here in the galleries. Jenny, that was so lovely. Thank you for joining us and showing us some of those highlights from ORCA exhibit. So this is an exhibit that was made by the Royal BC Museum in partnership with a company called Museum Partners. And uh, yeah, we're super proud of it. And it's going to be traveling as well. So uh, I'm not sure it doesn't have any other bookings in Canada right now, but it is booked in the United States and hopefully beyond. So it's great to get a small sense of what that's like. That's just a taste, but I hope you get the idea. It can be exciting to see those galleries and spaces and uh, an, an opportunity for kids to get that excitement of being at the museum. All right, Jenny, if questions come up, I'll do my best to answer them. Uh, thank you Sounds for great. joining us. <laughs> Definitely. Bye-bye. <laughs> great. So there is Jenny. I'm going to co go back here to sharing my screen with everybody. And we're going to carry on with some of the other um, opportunities that you can have to participate with the museum. So that was an opportunity to bring sort of the museum to your classroom in a virtual way. But we also have a physical way of bringing the museum to you. And these are outreach kits. And they're a collection of objects from the museum's handling collection and reproductions of objects that are from the museum. And we make these kits around a certain theme. And the kits are designed to be used by schools and educators to provide a hands-on object-based learning opportunity for people who can't physically visit us. And our kits are available for free. There's no cost. Uh, you get them for two weeks. And uh, inside are a lot of wonderful things for you to take a closer look at. So again, I'm gonna switch my cameras here and I'm gonna go to my object camera. And I hope you're seeing seeing that. Are folks seeing the object camera? Yes. Okay. You're seeing a, an image there. It's not showing up on my screen. Perfect. Thanks for confirming. So these are some reproduction images included in a kit called Having a Voice. And Having a Voice is designed for grade five. And it is for um, students who are looking at the curriculum of Canadian issues and governance. So one of the activities inside is an image analysis exercise. So there's about 10 or 12 reproduction images inside. Students can be put into groups. And then there's a workshop to offer them some guiding questions. So uh, first, you're just looking at that image quietly for a moment. So I'm going to let you just look at it. Look at the foreground and who you see sitting in the front. Take a look at the background and see if you can get an idea of maybe where this is. Zoom in on some of the faces and see if you can, what, does, what do their expressions say to you? Who do you notice sitting in these pictures? So after the students have had a chance to look more closely, there's a list where they can start listing the people. Maybe some students will count them. Uh, objects, are there anything other than people in this image? Activities, what are people doing? Uh, the landscape, where are they sitting? And then can start to think about, based on what you observed, List three things you might infer from this image. So you can use the chat and maybe tell me something. Looking at this image, what might you think is happening here? Go ahead and type anything you like in there. Ah, okay, something important. They look very serious. Yeah, so if you'd said something important, I'd ask you why, and they, they look serious. Their faces are serious. Uh, someone says, maybe the first female MLA, uh, maybe the B, at the BC Ledge. Great. Uh, someone's saying a picture of MPs or MLAs, perhaps the signing of a bill. Great. So you're starting to use some previous knowledge. We're recognizing some things in the landscape. Uh, you can then ask students, maybe what questions do they have? So question might be, are they signing a bill? Is that the first female MLA? Uh, then you have the students choose a question that they would think is the most important. Do you think it's more important to think about 
when they're signing it or who's in the picture. And then you can start to go from there. And we provide some resources in the kit to help you with that. So I won't leave you hanging. Uh, this picture is about the people inside, in particular, the woman that you spotted there in the middle. That woman is, I'm just going to make sure I get her name right. <clears throat> I'm looking in my piece. Her name is Mary Ellen, and she is the first MLA in British Columbia. And this, fo uh, this photo was taken in 1918, Mary Ellen Smith. And she was the first woman elected to the Legislative Assembly. And she went on to be both the first female cabinet minister and the first female speaker in the British Empire. So there's images students can look at. I'm going to take that off. I'm going to show you. Then there's some documents. So we have some activity suggestion plans. I'm going to get that a little straighter. I'm going to back it up a little bit so you can see. You can see how this is uh, in person. These documents uh, are reproductions from our archives and holdings here. And students, again, can work in small groups to look at these documents. And they're starting to think about some of the, uh, they're looking at primary sources. So they're getting introduced to that. They're getting used to reading uh, maybe some things that are a little difficult and figuring out what's going on at this time in this place. And what can we learn about the past from looking at documents like these and resources. So that's just a small example. This one here is uh, April 8th, 1947. And this one is about the franchise being given to Chinese and South Asian Canadians. And then it says down here in this row, uh, also Japanese and native Indians, Dukabors, Hutterites and Mennonites who have served in the Canadian forces will in future be allowed to vote. So this is one of the steps before the franchise was given in 49. So many different documents. I can just uh, show a few more to you there to give you an idea of the kinds of things that would be in this kit. Oh, my favorite image, let me find it. Here we are. Oh, that's not the one, <laughs> there's so many. Vote wet for my sake, vote dry for mine. You can talk about all the different uh, types of events that have taken place and have had an impact on on democracy. All right, I'm going to switch cameras again. You're back with me there, okay? And I'm going to share screen one more time to talk about a few other of our resources that we have. So again, those kits can be found on our website. Oh, Christopher, you have a question. Thanks. Yeah, uh, I just, as more of a comment, I just wanted to say that like the images that are the uh, political cartoons and stuff, those are really, really rich. And actually, I'm really glad you switched the screen because there's the one right there on the screen that is uh, showing uh, immigration and it's like got a closed gate blocking out what they would call Orient at the time and, and the white people be welcome in. I was just showing this to classes oh, this good. week from borrowing this kit in the past. So I've taken a screenshot of it, but like the, the richness of the observations the kids make from the political cartoons is just phenomenal. So yeah, love yeah. opportunities to borrow more of the kits. Good. Well, thanks for that feedback. Uh, and I, I agree. I think those political cartoons do because they're sort of summing up uh, how people were feeling at the time. And they're not um, it's not just this one um, governmental voice talking to us. This is more of the sense of the people and what was and their observations of what was happening beyond the dryness of the law that was also taking place. So I'm glad to hear you borrowed them. Uh, the image you see here on the screen, this is the writing on the wall kit, which is looking more at the history of Chinese Canadians. And it has some wall fragments inside and some video as well um, that you can play about the discovery of these uh, fragments that are pictured here on the screen. And again, uh, you can look up the kits on our website. 
sorry, I'll just show you back one, uh, how to book. You just go to our outreach website. Uh, there's a request button there. You type in your information, which kit you want to borrow. And again, you get a two week loan. One thing we've done with all of our outreach kits is made our educators guides available online so that you can look at those guides before you borrow the kit to help you get ready uh, after you sent the kit back, if you wanted to follow up or students still had questions about it. And then we've also put additional material related to each of the topics on the Royal BC Museum's learning portal. So the learning portal, hopefully folks have seen it. It's a non-linear learner-centered inquiry-based interactive website. And it has content for learners of all ages, but much of it is aligned to BC's K-12 school curriculum. I'm going to uh, see if we can go to that page. I think what I'm gonna to have to do Again, I'll ask folks if you are seeing um, seeing the learning portal on your screen right now. Great, you are, super. And thanks, Christopher, for uh, posting the link. And Monica, uh, do the kids have suggested grade levels? Yes, they do. And each of those grade levels are outlined. So writing on the wall is grade five and 10. Again, the, the activities are written in a way that you can use your skills as a teacher to adapt the content to fit your students. So you can dig a little bit more into the resources or maybe use more photos with the younger grades, for example. So the curriculum matches are there. So here is our learning portal, and there's lots of great ways to interact with it. Uh, the main ways are listed here at the top. They are pathways, timelines, maps, and playlists. So we're gonna start with pathways. I'm gonna just click on that. So pathways are like articles. They are deep dives into a subject or topic, and you can explore them in many ways. So you could enter a keyword search here uh, to, find, to find something. You could go by a theme. Uh, we could pick a location. And so based on where your school is, if you want to see what we have that's near you, this is up in Dawson Creek. Let's check Dawson Creek. Oh, good. We have something, species at risk pathway there. Um, Oh, I think let's go back to subject. You can search by subject. So we'll hit social studies. And clicker. oh, it still says Dawson Creek in social studies. So you can see you can get quite refined in how you want to search. Uh, you can also search using our educator page. This page uh, will give you a little video that you can watch to let you know how to do your searches uh, on the website. So also, it gets your choosing by subject or searching by grade level to find out what is there. So again, we can go grade four, seven, any, everything for grade four, seven. It might take a moment to load up all of them here and you can do your searches. As soon as it shows us one, I'm going to show you what you can get when you're digging inside. I've got a lot of windows open right now, so <laughs> it's going to take a little breather. talk amongst yourselves while it searches. Again, thanks, Christopher, for showing the link online there while I'm double multitasking. Great. I want to show you this newest uh, pathway called Landscapes of Injustice. So they all begin with a little summary page of what an, an overview of what this is about. And this pathway is looking at Japanese Canadians in British Columbia and the impact of Here we are. Uh, there's a read section. So in here we have some shorter articles that were written by an educator, uh, Tomo Nishi Nishizawa. And they are, again, not very long. They've got some images to help your um, young learners to be looking through them. Oh, my control panel is now in the way. I'll just close that one. And I lost it all, but I'm gonna show you how to get there from here. So educator resources, learning portal. This is from our main page and there's the landscapes of injustice. Let's go back to there. So you have different articles and links you'll find under overview, uh, sorry, overviews this page, different articles and links under read. On the watch channel are any videos that we have. So these are short three minute videos. Uh, that's a short three minute video. This is a longer, section where we went to the Japanese tea garden here in Victoria and learned about the tea garden and what happened during internment and what's happening now today. So there's video, there's 
images as well down here in our look section. All of these are images from BC Archives. You can click on them larger so that you can see them. Uh, you can even copy them and save them if you need to use them in your class. The listen section will have uh, resources. This one has two fantastic oral histories, again, for students to deep, dig deeper. And some of our portals, um, pathways rather, and more and more of them are, we are adding more teacher activities, activity plans and lesson ideas. So there's an elementary teacher resource, a secondary teacher resource, and then playlists. And playlists are something I will talk about in a moment. Now, another way to search the learning portal is to search using the timeline. So this is um, a resource where you can see objects from oldest to newest. So if you're wondering about some old things in BC, you can scroll through the timeline and see, get a sense of what's in the collection from a very long time ago up to more current images as well. The same can be done by searching the map, again, for students in certain regions. Uh, if we click these little numbers, we're going to see a brand new feature on the learning portal map, which are archival maps. And there are some pretty neat maps in here. Um, again, it could take a long time to look through all of them, but there's some really fun ways to search and to look there. Playlists are like mixed tapes. So this is something your students can do to share their work. Um, you, can sign, you can sign up to become a creator. And that lets you make your own themes and playlists about different things. So here's an immigrant experience in Canada. You click on this. And in this playlist, she has tagged different images, articles, videos that she likes, that she thinks talk well about the immigrant experience. There are some that have been created by staff and they're marked uh, with these little red marks and others are student and public creations. So it's a really, uh, it's a nice real way for students to share their learning with a real audience. Um, I see a question here in the chat about uh, the, again, about the outreach kits and if there's a shipping cost. At this time, there is no shipping costs for our outreach kits. So I'm really happy about that. They are available at no cost for people to borrow. All right, I'm going to share my screen one more time as we start to wrap towards our closing. So that was a little bit more about the learning portal. This one is our handling collection. And our handling collection uh, is something we use as museum educators for on-site and outreach programs for object-based inquiry. So these are objects from the museum's collections that were never accessioned or were deaccessioned, which means um, maybe they were duplicates, maybe there was no information about them, maybe they're not from British Columbia. Um, so they don't have a research value any longer for the museum. So they come to the handling collection where they have a value for us as objects of inquiry. Um, teachers can borrow them to make displays in the libraries, or you can use them as models for an art class, uh, and again, as a catalyst for inquiry. The one downside about this one is our handling collection is not available for shipping. So it is something right now that only folks who can pick it up in person are able to borrow. However, this is the collection that we do build our outreach boxes from. So if you had ideas for outreach boxes or you're teaching a certain unit in school and you wanted some extra things to make that display in your classroom, contact us. We are, we love to co-create and you can reach out to us to discuss your ideas and needs and we'll do our best to help you. So if it is one object from the handling collection, it's perfect. I think I could probably find a way to pack it up and to ship it to you. Um, this is our staff, Jenny, who you met upstairs. There I am in the middle. Uh, my colleague, Liz, uh, standing beside me. She focuses on our digital programs. Our new head of learning, Hannah Cho, is standing on the right side. And seated in front, Chris O'Connor. Uh, he's our kids, families, and schools programmer. So you may be familiar with him. And beside him is our newest staff member, Stephen Davies. And Stephen is looking at our Indigenous offerings and finding those gaps and opportunities for us to uh, add more programming and resources there. So my email is listed here and I invite you to reach out if you have ideas or suggestions. And uh, again, now, if you have any questions, uh, we've got a couple of minutes before we're out of time. And so I'm happy to answer any questions you might have. 
I'll make my background a little more interesting now that I'm not switching cameras. Let's go to a mammoth. Again, feel free to unmute or you can just type into the chat too. Hi, Christopher. I, I don't know that I really have a particular question yet, but I just loved hearing about some more things that are available. Like I have borrowed that uh, writing on the wall kit multiple times from our local museum who had borrowed it from the Royal BC Museum. Um, and it's just fantastic. Like I was sort of waxing poetic there about handling collections, even though the documents are reproductions because they look old tiny. Mm -hmm. And I could like dish those out to kids and give them like a little resource examination sheet where they had to like go through some observations about what do they notice? What, what do they think this is about? Why do they think this is considered important? And the, they just loved it. I mean, I, I'm doing those lessons of grade fives. And so they're just like, this looks like a real thing from the time. And, and the ones that are actually the writing on the wall, like samples as if they've been chiseled out of the wall. Um, yeah. Of course, there are the real ones somewhere in the museum collection, but just seeing that, they, they know it wasn't quite real, the real thing, but, but that excitement to touch something that's almost a primary document was, was pretty cool for them. So uh, that was, I'm, I'm really happy to hear that. That was our motivation. We wanted this, we just didn't want to put photocopies in things or pictures of pictures. We wanted them to feel real. And I, as a really positive result is they come back to us. They're never ripped. They're never graffitied. They're never crumpled or have anything dropped on them. People treat them really respectfully as they would an actual document because they look and feel like like the actual documents and pieces. Yeah. And just even part of that learning about respect and handling of, of, of materials is really, really special and part of it. So yeah, the, the kit you mentioned, the writing on the wall, that's our oldest kit. I think it's from 2015 or so. And I've never had to, re I've had to replace one little document and it tore just because mm -hmm. the actual document was sort of torn and worn in that way anyway. So out of, hundreds and hundreds of uses. It's very, I'm really happy to hear that. Mm -hmm. uh, one thing our local museum does, because they have a few kits too, they actually, like the Museum and Archives here in Chilliwack, they actually made some kits that have those little white archival gloves. And for some <laughs> reason, that just adds to it. The kids just thought that was like amazing. Because now it felt even more real. So again, they were handling reproductions, yeah. but they put on archival gloves and they, they were then so like careful and gentle with the stuff. It was pretty funny. But Oh, that's awesome. Oh, that's really great to hear. Yeah, Chilliwack's been lovely. Um, we, as part of our mandate, we know that teachers across the province who aren't near to us physically may not think of us as a resource. We're so far away. How could how could we have something for you? We act when we do have funding for kits like the writing on the wall for having a voice for species at risk. Uh, our outreach boxes. We've made duplicates. So that we have some here, but then we tried to send them out to regional museums and libraries as well. So we've had some with um, municipal libraries before. Mm -hmm. uh, the Resource Center in Dawson Creek has had some of our kits there just to facilitate that and make it easier as a place where you go to and uh, can get your resources from. Cool. Great. Well, again, thanks everyone who joined us today. I'm Glad we got an opportunity to talk about those resources, hopefully spark some ideas. Uh, there are resources there for all grade levels, and I think that can be used in, in many different ways. That's another area, and I'm trying not to write really um, prescriptive documents about how to use the kits. You're the experts. You know how to use them. I've had teachers who borrow an outreach kit and just make a display, and that's totally cool, too. So however you find to use them and want to use them uh, is really well. So thanks, everyone. Thanks for joining me. Enjoy the rest of the conference. Have a wonderful professional development day and take care of yourselves.